Now, one of the reasons we've, um, like for myself and David and Mark and a whole bunch of us have been arguing about some of the standards that should Olympic Dam go ahead, you know, ignoring the debate about actually, well, you know, there is a case to be made for it not to go ahead at all under any configuration, but let's just park that one to the side for the moment and we'll make an assumption, perhaps an unfair or reasonable assumption, but we'll make an assumption that it's going to go ahead. Um, what are the appropriate standards for managing those tailings in the long term? And, and I think in a lot of ways we can learn from experience elsewhere around the world. Last year I had the uh, privilege in some ways to be able to visit, um, you know, spend half a day on uh, travelling around the West Rand, just west of Johannesburg. Um, the Waters Rand Basin, of course, was one of the you know, big producers of gold for the for the best part of a century. And of course in 2007 they lost that mantle and uh, got overtaken by a country that starts with C and ends with H, I and A. Um, but 125 years worth of history in that region has produced more than 6 billion tonnes of tailings. That sounds similar to the sort of scale we're talking about with, uh, with uh, Olympic Dam. Um, but the other reason why it's important was gold, but also very low grade uranium often in, uh, in that gold ore. Right, so, and it's left an absolute mess. You know, I thought I'd seen some pretty polluted mine sites or things like that, but I'd never seen millions of people living next to it, and I'd never seen some of the sort of issues where you've got you know, rampant acid mine drainage and dust blowing everywhere and you know, things like that. So, um, so in that sense, the legacy that we're potentially leaving for future generations, we need to be learning from these um, bad examples. All right. um, and people say, oh, yeah, but that industry had no modern environmental regulations. It's like, yeah, sure, that's a fair comment, but um, at the end of the day, they've still got those billions of tonnes of radioactive tailings sitting above ground, um, blowing mindlessly across the region, and causing not only acid mine drainage, or the, that's also um, very largely related to the underground mining as well, but um, so yeah, there are some differences, but at the end of the day, the tailings are still there. Right, so, um, so for me, one of the things that I think, when I look at all of these things, is we can learn from that. And it's very clear to me that it's both uh, people like Mike Rand and, uh, and BHP Wilson have. Right. Now, when I was there, I looked at things, and this is just driving through parts of us, you know, um, West Rand in Johannesburg. Um, you can see the sort of white little mountain there. It's a tad hard to see in this photo, but there's just dust really blowing across from that, goes straight across the, uh, the roads, straight into people's houses. Um, there was actually an elderly village built right adjacent to that little tailing stump. And I say little, it's, you know, I think a few hundred million tons. Um, within two years, they had to actually shut that village down and relocate the people because they had radioactive heavy metal which tailings going straight into their houses. You know, um, so. When you look at some of that legacy and you go to, to the other side of that thing, you can see all the, the polluted water that's just leaking everywhere, and that's both an aspect related to the tailings, but also to the, to the old underground miners as well. We can see in the background there, there's a nice big dust cloud going straight off next to the word legacy. All right. Now sure, these sites haven't been covered yet. I can put up photos of Radio Mill that have been covered, and even after that cover, you can still see a nice dispersion of the tailings going away from there. This is the scale of risks that people um, are deciding for the future of South Australia. Right. So, in that sense, not just South Australia, it's also Australia and um, international as well. So, these are the sorts of legacies that we're, we're, we're going to be talking about. So, in that sense, when we move on, we think about, well, what does that mean? Um, I do a lot of work with the Mirror Mob up in Kakadu, who have been sort of, who have successfully fought and held off Jabaluka. Um, but we do have to deal with the issues around the range uranium mine. Um, now, the range of uranium mine, um, it's often argued to be the world's best practice or the world's most regulated mine. It's been, being, you know, uh, I suppose, you know, so competent and obviously world class, it was forced to shut down for five months this year because otherwise they would have had a trading stamp failure that was straight into Kakadu. That's world's best practice, I'd hate to know the world's worst. Um, but anyway, Ranger does have a legal requirement from the Commonwealth that thou shalt isolate tailings and put it back into the pits. Um, the wind out pits. So that way, um, in the long term, um, there'll be no impact from those tailings or solutes derived from those tailings, which is a, a nice scientific term for contaminants or pollutants, um, for at least 10,000 years. That sounds pretty good. You know, um, but let's think about the evidence. Radium Hill was already eroding after 10 years, and that was covered. Um, we're getting massive dust problems. Um, you know, from sites like Johannesburg, where we've got that blowing everywhere. Um, so in that sense, when we look at impit tailings, instead of it being above ground, exposed to the, to the surface environment, by putting at least back below ground, that's easily demonstrable that it is world's best practice. 
So at least if, you know, if uh, Mike Mann has to leave a legacy, one of the legacies he can say to BHP is, well, sure, if it takes you 30 years to put it back, that's the cost of doing business in South Australia. We're not going to sell out the South Australian environment um, all right, just so BHP can uh, kick up 0.1% you know, on their extra profits. All right, so in that sense, whether it's environmental risk or radioactive, radioactivity risk, um, you could probably also add in cultural risk. You could, um, if the potatoes are back below ground, a lot of the land that was used for tailing stamps um, could potentially become available for other land use as well. So it's a, I think an overall it's a much bigger, a much stronger outcome. Right. Um, so I think, you know, and even after going through the supplementary EIS and these aspects, um, Olympic Dam is still failing that acid test. Right. So I think if we're, if it's the, uh, you know, the big Australian, as, as David said, they don't call themselves that anymore. They call themselves the big fella. You know. Um, so they're clearly still failing. You know, they might be, they might be big, but that also means they're failing. Right. Um, now, I'll just add this in. I was almost going to delete this out, but I think um, it's just it's one. Um, we often hear about BHP wanting to sell uranium for uh, you know, greenhouse friendly power. All right. now, if we look at both BHP Billiton and Rio Tinto, um, they earn a ton of money from coal. Almost literally a ton of money if you actually put it into you know, 50 dollar notes and put it into a trailer or something. But um, if we look at 2010, Australian coal exports, we only account the emissions where they're actually where they occur, and because we don't burn that coal in Australia, it's burned in China, Israel, you know, over half the known world in terms of countries. Um, that's about 770 million tonnes per year. Right. And that's growing exponentially as the coal industry expands. Um, thanks Mr BHP, thanks Mr Rio, and Anglo-American and Extrata and a whole bunch of others. But it's, um, right, even if we made this dubious assumption that every single tonne of Australian uranium actually shut down the coal-fired power station and then replaced it with a even at zero emissions nuclear power station, that's another furphy, but let's make that assumption for the moment. Um, for 2010, the most you could actually get is around about 257 million tonnes of, tons of uh, greenhouse emissions deleted from that, um, from that debt. So we've still got the size of the Australian economy difference, and that's just coal, it doesn't include um, gas exports or things like that as well. Uh, and of course, nuclear power, when we export our uranium, no nuclear power station actually shuts down a coal-fired power station. It just adds to the total load, so the emissions are still there. So in reality, it's actually really zero. Right? So if we added that and we're actually realistic about that debate, Australia would triple our emissions by <coughs> nine. And BHP is directly responsible for that. So I think they're using it as a wedge as a diversion, and we'll go from there. So, okay, thanks. Yep. Right. Now, finish with this slide. This, this is uh, Yvonne Margaret Ruller, I'm sure most people know. Um, Yvonne, she's the senior traditional owner for the Mirai mob. Um, thanks. Yep. Right. Um, this is her saying. I can translate this into science as opposed to Punjabi language. Um, and again, we're having this debate in South Australia. Like Mike Rand and BHP are promising the world. But I can guarantee you, in 50 years' time, when all of these problems are big and ongoing, um, they won't be here to fix them. So, in that sense, I think Yvonne is largely saying that from social impacts and things like that, but from environmental impacts, it's exactly the same message. The, you know, the, the promises uh, never last, the problems will always be. Thank you.